Hello everybody, welcome to the Workman Song Channel. Thanks for joining me. Who am I? My name's Sean McMahon. I do a lot of music and I do a lot of theology on this channel. Today is going to be a little something different because it's actually going to touch on the relationship I have with both of those things smushed together into one thing. And that one thing, of course, is music ministry. I've been in music ministry one way or another for over 10 years at this time in my life, and it's been a big part of my life. In fact, it was kind of a disruptive thing in my life, as you'll see, because I grew up wanting to be a rock star, and then once this Jesus fella came into my life, a lot of those hopes were dashed. Now, if you're a rock star who happens to love Jesus, I salute you because everyone has their own calling, but I have mine. Mine is a little different. I've been on tour. I've spent about five or six years on the road uh, during the time that I was based in New York City. I did all that stuff as a side man, a little bit as a front man. I never found it all that satisfying in the ultimate sense. I loved it. I had lots of fun. I loved the people I did it with. I got into some trouble, but thankfully not too much. Would I never go back out on the road again? Actually, I would be happy to go back out on the road again, but I'd like to take my family this time around. Although, come to think of it, what am I talking about? I actually have been touring with my family in tow pretty much for the past five, six years, give or take. Just not as extensively as I used to. We do little jaunts, maybe one to two weeks tops. Regional stuff, though. Like last year, we went up to Vermont. Uh, we played Boston Calling. Yeah, took the family on all those trips. I think the last little tour I did without my family was in the fall of 2022. And, you know, I miss them too much. And I just don't think it's a good idea to leave your family too long without a father. But yeah, would I like to do a longer stretch sometime in the future? Kind of, yes. I mean, practically, not really. <laughs> um, but, you know, living out on the road, as anyone can tell you, is a lot of fun. And... There's a lot of people who do it with their families. They do the whole van life or they do even bigger stuff. My wife is deep into this YouTube channel called Flying the Nest, where this family of four with like two young kids, they travel the world constantly. It's crazy. I have no idea how they do that. What do their kids eat? When do they go to bed? My Lord. But we did start homeschooling the kids so that we could travel when necessary. But mainly, I think now our M.O., is music ministry and missionary work. So that's all to say, I was living the rock star life for a solid period of time in my New York City days. But really what intervened in my life it was some sort of vocation to ministry in the church. That's what disrupted my rock star life. There was something yanking at me that said, Sean, you got to go to church and you got to get involved. Now, anyone familiar with this channel knows that the majority of the content nowadays is theology. It's explicit Christian ministry. But this channel was actually started when I lived in New York City, and my main thing was being Workman Song, the musician, the indie rocker, or the sensitive indie folk singer-songwriter that wanted to be more of a rocker, but it was hard to get a band <laughs> together around me. And I wrote a lot of songs, and it was always kind of making me a little bored to play the same songs over and over again. Now, those of you who are churchgoers know that you switch it up every week, right? So I guess I was meant to be in the music ministry of a church on some level. But in the story that you're about to listen to, my story, you're going to hear about music ministry, not only in the context of a church, but outside the walls of the chapel. And you're going to hear stories about people who really inspired me, who did very unusual things things in their music ministry, people like Reverend Vince Anderson, which grew out of another very unique community that was headed up by Jay Baker. I made a lot of lifelong connections in these intersecting communities in New York City, but it wasn't until I ended up here on Martha's Vineyard that all these strings, the rock star thing, the music ministry thing, they all started coming together. When I moved to Martha's Vineyard, I started something called the Holy Rock and Roll Revival, where I basically did spiritual rock and roll at a dive bar every Sunday night. And a couple of years later, I found myself in music ministry at a bunch of churches around the island. And then in 2020, bang, I got called into the pulpit. So I've been around the block with different types of ministry, again, in and outside of the chapel walls. 
The story you're about to hear is just a small piece of my story, but I really hope you enjoy listening to it. And if you're someone who's been wondering about whether music ministry is a calling in your life, maybe you'll get something out of this. I wouldn't share it if I didn't hope and think that maybe you will get something out of it. All right. Well, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button if you find yourself enjoying this message. Without further ado, here is the message on ministry through music that I gave at the Chilmark Community Church on Tuesday, June 4th, 2024, for the Neighborhood Convention, which is a monthly ecumenical meetup of all the island churches, give or take. Here we go. Hello, everybody. Would you like to join me in singing hymn number 361, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me? It's also in your program. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill laws demands could my zeal no respite know could my tears forever flow all for sin could not atone thou must save and thou alone while I draw this fleeting breath when mine eyes shall close in death when I soar to worlds unknown See the on thy judgment throne, rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Nice singing, everybody. Y'all know that one? I think I first heard that one in a Baptist church. Raise your hand if you're Baptist. And yet you all know it anyway. That's the cool thing about music. Uh, A year ago, when I was baptized into the Catholic Church, I thought that spelled the end of my days in ministry. And yet, within a month, I get a call from Charlotte, and she says, would you like to do music ministry at the church? I said, really? You want me to do that? You know what I just did? She said, oh, yeah. That's fine. And I talked to Father Paul. I said, is that okay if I do that at a different church? She's like, oh, yeah. I said, huh. Well, then here I am. God works in mysterious ways, and it's a testament to the heart of the churches and the people on the island to be able to see past these lines that can sometimes be arbitrary. And also, I dare say, it tells us a little bit about music and how music can sometimes forge paths where maybe they weren't before. So, let's talk a little bit about music. Shout out some of your favorite song names really quick. Don't be shy. I know it's... Blackbird by the Beatles? Yeah. September Song. September Song. Which, what's that from? Ah, <laughs> you're too young to know. There's an old song from the 40s. Very much from the 40s. Very much what? On Hit Parade. Okay, uh, on Hit Parade. <laughs> All right, we got some radio stuff. I like Ace of Joy of Man's Desire and yeah. Dancing Queen. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, Johann Sebastian Bach and Abba, right? Yeah. Well, there you go. So that's a little bit of uh, what we would call secular music and a little bit of sacred music. But these songs mean a lot to you, right? Yeah, in either case. I remember my mother telling me the song Father and Son by Cat Stevens was a song she'd sing to herself whenever she was struggling in life. So I'll tell you a little bit about my relationship with music and music ministry? Well, for me, it started when I was pretty young in some ways. Um, when I was very young, I think I was probably six or seven, one day the doorbell started ringing. And it started ringing over and over. And I was the one to answer the door. And it was my neighbor, Anne, and she was in a complete horrible panic. And she said, something terrible has happened to Michael our neighbor, and I'd never seen a grown-up act like her before, so scared. And all of the neighborhood children 
and their parents, we all gathered on the sidewalk as police vehicles and an ambulance pulled up to the house of my mother's best friend, Carol. Her son, Michael, who was only in his early teens, had just taken his own life at gunpoint. I don't know why, but years later, when I was 18, I wrote a fairy tale, as in a fiction, around this story in song, and it was called The Ballad of Mighty Jim and His Mother, and I recorded a demo of it, I saved it on the family computer, and I forgot about it. But my father had a habit of nosing through my song files, a really annoying habit, and he found Mighty Jim, and he showed it to my mother, and my mother sent it to Carol. And Carol was very moved. Carol was a member of a suicide survivor's support group, as in those who survived the suicide of their loved ones. They met in a chapel at the local hospital where the sacred space was held by a nun. Carol asked if I would play Mighty Jim for the community there. And at that time in my life, I was not yet a professional performer. I daydreamed only about being a rock star. And I'd played a few school talent shows and open mics. So the support group was not the stadium I'd imagined for my rock songs. And Mighty Jim is not a song that I ever thought would have legs for a rock and roll career. It's an intimate song, and whenever I played it, I had to relive the day that Michael died very vividly in my mind. And I knew that Carol had to as well when she heard it. So I was very scared to sing this song for everyone. And my fears were not unfounded, because as I sang Mighty Jim for this small community, I could feel everyone in the room reliving the traumatic day that they found out someone they loved had taken their life. So as the narrative in the song of the mother finding her beloved son's lifeless body, as that narrative wound into the fairy tale, into the fiction part, her son returns. And he consoles her and he assures her that all will be well in spite of her loss. He says, you're breathing and you love. That's all you need. And then the children of the neighborhood become her surrogate children because she has this infinite well of love for a child that she will never hold again. So she draws on this to share her love with all the neighborhood children. And they tell her, it's okay, we're only meant to live as long and as well as we can. I hope you understand, I hope that you can. And she does, the mother weeps and she lifts up her eyes and her heart feels lighter, the sky's a bit brighter. And she turns to the children to say children play, it's a beauty day everything's okay everything's okay everything in every single way and she sang to her children and she gave them flowers and she kissed her lovers and all of her sisters and their brothers celebrate the miracle they dance to the music that always had been and that's how the song ends and afterward the nun who facilitated this group she took me aside after the meeting and she told me these words I never forgot. She said, Sean, you have redeemed the world. Now, I knew that was impossible, because I'm not God. I didn't believe in God at the time, but I knew it was impossible, but that's what she told me. You have redeemed the world, and what she meant is that their world, the survivors in the world, was redeemed by a song. I didn't believe in God yet, but I felt him nudge me that day, and I heard him speak to me through that nun. I don't remember her name, but because of what she said, I knew that I'd never be a rock star. Because whatever I had just done there that day, I would have to do that again. I would have to redeem the world. That's what music ministry can be. And that's what it is. 
I started to meet God more and more after that, just not long enough to catch his name. He was one of those characters in my life that popped up. You know this dude. He, he comes up to you. You keep running into him. He knows your name. You never remember his. You're always on the move. You try to keep the interaction brief. He suggests you get together for coffee. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe next week. Maybe we can. Yeah. Never happens. But one day, the stars align. The next thing you know, well, you're best friends. Sometimes that happens. Maybe one of those people in your life is going to be like that, right? Well, once I learned his name and accepted his friendship, God and I started hanging out at church. And one thing I found out fast is pastors love when you're a musician. The first church I ever visited was an upstart evangelical church where they knew young pastor, and I was fresh from New England Conservatory with a shiny new music degree. And the church didn't have a music ministry yet. So guess who was asked to start leading worship the next week? And that's music ministry too, isn't it, right? I reckon that's what most people think of when they hear the word music ministry. But for me, it was a bit awkward at first. I never went to church. I was a brand new baby Christian at that time. So my pastor mentored me, uh, not just in singing the praise songs, but leading worship, like leading prayer, not written ones, spontaneous ones. I had to learn the lingo. I also had to invite people to do stuff, to stand, to raise their arms, all that stuff. Gestures I had never made myself from the pews because my little gift of music made me skip right over the pews into this music ministry. So for me, to be honest, it was very weird. But as I led worship, every Sunday, I was watching worshipers. And that's when I began to understand worship, liturgy, sitting down, standing up, raising your arms, bowing your head, and closing your eyes, holding hands. It's so much more than words, whether listening or speaking or singing them. This is the embodied living breathing, dancing, faith, which the word became flesh to deliver to us. But how to synchronize the body of Christ in all of this worship? Music, as it turns out, is necessary. Necessary. There are explicit commands in the Bible from King David himself, such as in Psalm 98, where he commands exuberance. He says, burst forth. Let your cry ring out and sing praises. And he even micromanages. He uh, sets the instrumentation like an arranger. He says, sing praises to the Lord with a lyre, as in a guitar, in melodious song with a harp, with trumpets, and to the blast of a ram's horn. So these are loud instruments. To compete with the horns, the people would have to shout for joy to the Lord, is what he said, right? Also, the king would not abide laziness and complacency with all the old chestnuts. In Psalm 96 and a few others, so you know it was important to him, he commands, sing to the Lord a what song? New song. New song, yeah. Yeah, he was a heck of a psalmist, King David. He was a songwriter, right? But these words are our inheritance from him and his demand on all generations that we don't simply worship the Lord with the songs of our ancestors alone but that we continue making music for our living communities and pass those on to our children. And so the church continues tradition, not merely by preserving it, right? Which is one of the ways we think of continuing traditions, but not just by preserving it, but also contributing to it. St. Paul instructs the Ephesians church to be creative. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord. It's a creative act. And he instructs us to do something fascinating and truly wonderful. Don't just speak with, with one another with plain words. Sing to one another. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And all this with feeling, no doubt, right? So after a year at the Evangelical Church, I had a very classic early 20-something millennial crisis. A lot of us have had this crisis the details of which I won't bore you, but I resolved this crisis by moving to New York City in hopes of staying as far away from religion as possible and instead becoming a rock star. And I suppose at that time in my life, I forgot what God told me through that nun. So I was a Jonah of sorts, 
And as it turned out on my first day wandering the belly of the whale, by which I'm in Brooklyn, I ran into and then had coffee with a man named Jay Baker, who was the son of Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, the televangelists who had a controversy. And so Jay also had a run-in with religion that he sort of ran away from as well, like me. But Jay was running a bar church, as in a church that meets in a bar. It was called Revolution NYC, and he invited me, and it was an evening service that I went to, and people were sitting and drinking beers and cocktails while Jay led prayer and gave sermons. There was a visiting Northern Irish theologian named Peter Rollins who talked about Paul Tillich and the necessity of doubt in faith. All this was very confusing to me, but hey, it was in a bar, and I wanted to stay away from religion at the time. There was a burly fellow with a bit of a lisp and a voice like crunching rock, and he was leading the music ministry, and that was Reverend Vince Anderson. And he ran his own kind of bar church every Monday night at a place called Union Pool. But unlike Revolution NYC, there were no sermons at Reverend Vince's church. It was just Reverend Vince, his band, and about four hours of music. And uh, Vince visibly liked his liquor up there, but he loved Jesus even more. And all the songs were songs about Jesus. Some had cuss words in them, so he called the style of his songs Dirty Gospel. The room was always packed with weekly parishioners who knew all these songs, but they weren't church people. Many were people who had negative experiences and associations with church. And Reverend Vince was keenly aware of this. He rarely sermonized, but when he did, it was brief with the band going behind him, and maybe he was sliding down the banister of the stairwell or walking across the bar as he did this. But I recall one of these mini sermons, and it was something to the tune of the following, and I'm sanitizing it because the language was not clean, but he says, for those of you who grew up in a church full of bullies, I'm sorry, but Jesus loves you. He always has and he always will, and anyone who tells you otherwise can attend to their own affairs. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure Jesus said so too. I've... Now, Reverend Vince was actually a scholar there was a method to his madness, and it was gleaned from his love of Bible study and massive, massive library of Christian theology. And I talked to him a little bit about Monday nights, what it was all about, what was the method to the madness, and he boiled it down to one thing. He said that every space becomes a liturgical space when you minister in it. Once upon a time, Reverend Vince thought that he would be a pastor or a priest, and he did his time in the seminaries uh, preparing for this. But once he actually went out into the spaces of the world, he discovered that his ministerial gift was just music. That was that. It's just what worked. It's what connected him with people, and it's how he ministered Christ. Music ministry is how he turned Union Pool, a, a grody bar, <laughs> into a liturgical space for about 50 to 100 people every week. A liturgical space that is a place of redemption for people seeking it when they could not find it in a church. So they found it in an unlikely place, ministered through an unlikely person, using unlikely words and, of course, unlikely music. I saw Reverend Vince redeem the world many times at Union Pool. If you could see, you could see it in people's faces. If you could hear it, you could hear it in the words they were singing. But even if you were deaf and blind, you could feel it. The spirit blows where it will. And you hear the sound thereof. But you never know where it's from or where it's going, as in where it's going to take you. That's the thing about music. Most people don't actually judge music by its sound. We don't really do that, do we? At the end of the day, it's more about feeling, right? And you know the saying, once more, but with feeling. And we have a very specific word for that feeling nowadays. We call it soul. Man, that singer's got soul. That band plays with soul. I don't know what it is. That guy can't really sing. That guy can't really play guitar, but he has soul, right? Well, music is like prayer in that way. 
The most beautiful, theologically accurate prayer can be distilled into words on a page like the Psalms. If you can read it, you can read the Psalms. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're praying. Without that prayerful intention, without feeling, without soul, is it really praying? So this is where music comes in. Music is the language of feeling and soul. It helps us feel something we weren't feeling before, something we couldn't feel on our own. The Psalms were not meant to be recited. They were meant to be sung with feeling and with soul. If I had my way, the whole church service would be sung, like in the old days where it was chanted, right? One of my favorites, St. Ephraim the Syrian, one of the greatest theologians and preachers of the fourth century, his theological works and his sermons were all songs. They were all sung. They were verse. They were not prose. He thought, and he wrote this explicitly, he thought that prose was unworthy of theology, which to him was not an intellectual science, but a spiritual discipline. If God wanted to redeem the world through abstract philosophy, I'm sure he could have. But it doesn't seem that's what he wanted to do. He chose encounter. He chose relationship. That's why he became one of us. St. John gives us a glimpse into the mystery of the incarnation in the first chapter of his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that's been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men, that light which we all seek, right? Everything came into being through the Word of God. That is, how do you say a word? With your voice. The voice. Sound. So these are pretty wise words from the first century because it took our modern scientists quite a long time to eventually learn how to measure this mystery that the entire creation is vibrating. It's humming. It's singing. God's creation is a song, a symphony with moments of consonants as well as dissonance. There are perfect fifths, And perfect fourths, those are these, right? Those are perfect intervals. They crop up where the laws of music allow them, but by the way, successive perfect intervals are traditionally prohibited in music theory. The path to these moments of perfection have to be paved by a dance of major, minor, and diminished intervals, tension and release. Those are the laws of music, but doesn't that sound a lot like life? The prophet Isaiah recorded a promise of God to his people. Ye shall have a song. As in the night when a holy solemnity is kept, and gladness of heart, as when one goeth with a pipe, as in brass woodwind, not corn cob, as when one goeth with a pipe to come into the mountain of the Lord, to the mighty one of Israel, and the Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard. That's a promise made and kept. I've learned that the Lord is always causing his glorious voice to be heard, not just in the song of creation, but through the voices of his people. Like the voice of the nun who taught me the simple truth about redemption. It's about restoring soul. The ministry of redemption has many vehicles, or I should say instruments. That's us, many instruments. We all have different gifts, ways peculiar to each person by which God speaks to others. And I suppose mine just happens to be music. When I was younger, I definitely had different dreams for how to use my musical gifts till that nun showed me higher hopes. Music is medicine. It doesn't have to only be Christian music or praise music to be music ministry. Music with soul can heal the soul. And you can read study after scientific study where music has demonstrably healed the mind and even the body. What a glorious mystery that is. Well, we are all stewards of mysteries like this. Music happens to be mine. Thank you for listening as I've revealed some of the trade secrets of my ministry. And may God bless all of you and yours. Thank you.
like to, we can sing a hymn that I wrote. There's enough time. It's called Love is My True Family, and it's in the, the bulletin. Under the heading, Love is My True Family. I am of the nation founded in heaven on the day the first light came to be. Obscured in the darkness and overgrown by weeds, buried in the clay of Adam's heavy sleep. Within me is a treasure, the most precious jewel. For her sake I'm clothed with light Anointed with the dew Fallen from the Tabor Mount And given Gihon's drink Springing from the side of Christ I am the child of God most high My brother is the king of kings My mother is the wisdom Weaving all the worlds together slave for your truth has set me free there's nothing I won't gain if I give for trials I give thanks for enemies I pray for you oh love I've died so that I may truly live I am the child of God most high my brother is the king of kings my mother the 